Let us worship the Lord, singing to his praise and glory in the words of Psalm 60, 60. We're going to sing from the beginning of the psalm, the tune is Kul Ross. O Lord, thou hast rejected us and scattered us abroad. Thou justly hast displeased been. Return to us, O God. Then you see the next verse. The earth to tremble thou hast made, therein its breaches make. Well, isn't that precisely what we have at the moment? Do thou thereof the breaches heal, because the land doth shake. There is a shaking going on, a shaking in and a shaking out. And to thy people thou hard things hast shown, and on them sent, and thou hast caused us to drink wine of astonishment and yet a banner thou hast given to them who thee do fear that it by them because of truth displayed may appear psalm 60 1 through 4 the tune is called ross o lord thou hast rejected us Unite together now in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, how true these words are. The words we have sung together. The earth to tremble thou hast made. Therein did breaches make. Do thou thereof the breaches heal because the land doth shake. Many things are being shaken in these days. Many things that seemed solid and secure. Help us, O Lord, to learn from these things, so that we will be building not upon the sand that can be shaken and removed, but upon the rock that is sure and steadfast. We come, O Lord, in the name of Christ, pleading the leading and guiding of the Spirit, so that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. And we know that 
Nothing is acceptable in thy sight, but what comes of thyself, what comes of thy spirit. We pray, O Lord, that our worship today would be in spirit and in truth, that we would really be in the spirit on the Lord's day, and that we would be being taught by thyself in our souls and led by thyself in all that we engage in. Keep us, O Lord, from leaning upon ourselves and keep us looking to thyself, particularly in holy things. And be with us, O Lord, in these turbulent days. We have sung of drinking the wine of astonishment and how astonishing it is, the changes that have been wrought upon our land and across the world in a matter of a few days, a few short weeks. Our uh, economy grinding almost to a halt. Our ordinary social life coming abruptly to an end. And oh, how solemnly our church is closed, up and down the land. The gathering of people in worship is suddenly brought to cessation. We are drinking the wine of astonishment. Help us, Lord, to hear what God is saying to the churches and to discern well thy voice and to hear in it a call to return and a call to repent and a call to seek the Lord while he may be found and to call upon him while he is near. And yet as we come, we come again with the words we sung in our hearts, yet a banner thou hast given to them that he do fear that it by them, because of truth displayed, may appear. As we attempt today to unfurl the gospel banner, and may it be unfurled by thine own hand, a greater hand than ours, and may it blow with the blowing of God's Spirit, so that it will be seen, so that that banner will be read, read by those who are near and those who are far away, and those who have not care to look at it for a long time, that their eyes would turn and see what it says. And we know what it says at its heart, eh, that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As it unfurls, it speaks of the holiness of God. It speaks of his unchanging justice. It speaks of our plight and our position as sinners. And it speaks of a Saviour uh, who is ready to receive all who come to him. He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Bring us all then coming to the Lord, really coming, and uh, not coming in some half-hearted temporary way, but really coming, really drawing near really searching and really seeking, perhaps as never before. We crave then the leading and help of thy Spirit, and we crave it in our homes and in our families. Remember us, Lord, in all of our needs. Receive our thanks for thy kindness toward us, even in temporal things. We have been spared many things that others have not been spared, and we have even in our nation provision and infrastructure which many poor nations in the world do not have, and who will fall eh, in a terrible plight as this uh, disease spreads across them. We acknowledge, eternal Lord, that even in these things thy goodness and thy kindness is seen. Watch over us, O Lord, we pray, and uh, guard and keep us. Guard and keep those who are most vulnerable, and who will be eh, most seriously afflicted were this plague to come into their homes and into their own families. We pray, Lord, that uh, thou thyself would be ruling and overruling in all of these things. And we pray for those who are unwell, whether with this illness or with other. We pray, Lord, for healing and progress. Thou art able to do both and more beyond. And we pray for patience in the midst of trouble. And we pray for blessing and sanctifying influence 
in the midst of difficulty. May we believe that these things are sent to sanctify thy people and to teach others and to show them their need of thyself. We pray for uh, those who are the many who are unwell, who this week have discovered that uh, they have tested positive to this illness. We pray, Lord, for the many in hospitals. We pray for healing and progress there. And we pray that for many of them so seriously unwell, their thoughts would turn to eternity and to the things of God, and that like the thief on the cross, eh, they would ask that the Lord would remember them, the Lord, the great King of this kingdom, this kingdom of grace, this kingdom of mercy and of gospel provision. We pray, eternal Lord, eh, for those who look after them, uh, those who serve in the front line of all of these things, whether in the health service or as carers or as those who keep the lines of provision and supply open up and down our nation. Uh, we pray, eternal Lord, for them. And we pray, Lord, for uh, thy kingdom and thy cause in the midst of all of this. Outwardly, uh, things have altered and uh, things have stopped in many ways. But ah, the kingdom will not stop, and the kingdom does not alter, and its plans are not forced to change. They are the same, and this was part of that great plan. This was part of God's eternal purposes, uh, that in this year, 2020, uh, these events would occur, and uh, that uh, uh, through them, thy kingdom would be advanced. And the kingdom of darkness weakened and brought down. It may look at times as though it is advancing. Eh, but uh, that is not the case at all. Christ has triumphed over it all. And its power is broken. And it is only uh, but a mere matter of time. Until Christ's triumph is seen. Openly, finally and completely. Over all that stands against it. We pray for the many across the world who have no God to turn to and no Bible to open. We pray for the many who trust in falsehood, who turn to some poor idol that they have made and fashioned themselves. We pray, Lord, that in their extremity they would seek the one who made heaven and earth and who is able to hear and to answer as none else can. We do pray, eternal Lord, for uh, our own concerns locally we think of homes and families and circumstances and needs we pray for our presbytery and our congregations beyond our presbytery we think of eh, the congregations in Sri Lanka touched and affected by all of this and we pray that they would be given help and wisdom as they deal with it we think of our friends in France and Spain eh, hit eh, by this and in some cases hit far harder than we have been. Guard and protect them. We think of the presbytery of the United States. It too has its own share. We think of the nation of China as it appears to be emerging from these things. Ah, we pray that its leaders would be humbled and that the hand of persecution and cruelty that has been exacted against thy church so often uh, that under these events that hand would be lifted and that uh, the gospel would have free course and be glorified. We pray, Lord, for those who govern us. It is not an easy task, and it is doubly difficult in these hours. We pray, Lord, that they would pray as they make their decisions, that they would remember the word of God, and that the Holy Spirit himself would work and strive in hearts and souls. Remember the Queen and the royal household. Grant, Lord, that they and all who govern and lead and who have the ear of the nation, uh, would, uh, in the midst of all their advice, uh, would speak of prayer, would speak of the things of God, and that uh, it would not be a mere a bypassing word, uh, but that they would speak about it because they mean it, and because they have come to understand it. Hear us, Lord, we pray. Uh, lead us into the truth. Uh, we come with a confession of sin. Help us, Lord, to really, really come with a confession. To really understand what it is. 
and to turn with grief and hatred from our sin and full endeavor after new obedience. Give us humility. We confess our pride. We give us godliness. We confess our worldliness. Give us faith. We confess our unbelief. Give us through love. We confess our lovelessness, our coldness, our hateful spirit, our uh, judgmental attitudes at times, seeing a Eh, what is in our in the eyes of others, but failing to see something far greater than our own. We give us, Lord, we pray, the spirits that are humble, the spirits that seek Christ and seek the covering of the blood and seek to walk humbly without God. Prepare us, Lord, for all that is prepared for us. We don't know what will be from week to week. We never know that. But we, 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 we see these things in a sharper light in these days and ever before. Remember us then, Lord. Remember those who are lonely, those who are isolated, those who cannot join with us in worship, uh, those who are alone, very much alone. Enter into their loneliness and meet with them in their isolation. Hear us now, Lord, we pray. Cleanse us and receive us. The blood has been shed and the sacrifice offered. The Calvary has come and gone and its work is successful. And he is risen again. He is a great high priest who lives to make intercession. In him we trust and to him we look. He is our king and our prophet. We have no other and we need no other. For Christ is all and in all. May he be all and in all for us. And may we share in all that he has so that we are able to say that we are complete in him. We're always incomplete until we're in him. But if we are in him, we are complete, for he makes us complete in and through himself. Hear us then, we pray. Lead us, guide us, guard us, and cleanse us. For Jesus' sake, amen. We turn now to God's word, and we turn to the scriptures of the New Testament and to the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. And we're going to read in chapter 12. Hebrews and chapter 12. And you remember the way chapter 12 begins. It's looking back into chapter 11 and that great list of heroes of the faith who we read off there. Chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he, be, whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we much not rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. 
Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, <clears throat> but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For we know how that afterward he would have received the blessing he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire. He's talking here of Sinai and the children of Israel drawing near to the mountain. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. May the Lord follow with his blessing that reading of his own holy and inerrant word of truth. We turn to sing again to God's praise in Psalm 47. Psalm 47, 4, 7. We're going to sing the first Two verses, verses 1 and 2, and then it's going to go to verse 5, and we'll sing from verse 5 onwards. Reading at verse 1, All people clap your hands to God, with voice of triumph shout, for dreadful is the Lord Most High, great King, the earth throughout. And then at 5, God is with shouts gone up, the Lord with trumpets sounding high. Sing praise to God. Sing praise, sing praise, praise to our King, sing ye. The tune is Scarborough, Scarborough, all people clap your hands to God.
While seeking the light of God's Spirit on his own word, we turn again now to that twelfth chapter of Hebrews from which we read together. The epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, in chapter 12. We're going to read just now at verse 25. Hebrews 12, reading at verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And then perhaps we can narrow down our reading and a uh, uh, begin at uh, the middle of verse 26 yet once more i shake not the earth only but also heaven and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved This is a remarkable epistle from the Apostle to these Jewish believers who had come to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour. The whole epistle is remarkable and each chapter in turn is remarkable. From the glorious revelations in chapter 1 about who Christ is to the striking encouragements of the final chapter, chapter 13, with its call to press on. And then, of course, there is the great 11th chapter, with its great list of uh, heroes and stalwarts of the faith. And this chapter, as I commented in our reading, follows on in a very orderly way from that 11th chapter. As the Apostle encourages these Jewish Christians to press on in the faith no matter what might come. As it says in verse 1, we are compassed about with this great cloud of witnesses. Lay aside every weight, he says, uh, the sin that so easily besets. Run with patience the race before us. And here in the closing verses of the uh, chapter and in our text, we have something of the same theme. In verse 28, we are exhorted, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, to have grace, so that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Well, that's the general outline that we have here. But let's now come from the general to the particular. And as we come to these verses, I want us to notice that Paul is doing three things here. First of all, Paul makes a prediction. Secondly, Paul 
shares a proclamation. And thirdly, Paul gives a precaution. We have a prediction, a proclamation, and a precaution. Well, first of all, then, we see in these verses that Paul makes a prediction. That's what Paul is doing here in this context. He's making a prediction about something that was going to happen. Something that was going to happen, in fact, just a few short years after he wrote these words. Now, you notice in verse 26 that it speaks of the voice of God shaking the earth. We know from the context that we have here that that's a reference to God speaking loudly at Mount Sinai when he met with Israel and when they received the law from the hand of God. The apostle has made a number of references to Sinai and to the events of Sinai in the context here. God has spoken, his voice shook the earth then. But then you see what he says. He says that God has promised that he is going to shake that earth again. He's going to speak again and things are going to happen. And it's that speaking again, that things going to happen again, that Paul is speaking about here as he makes a prediction. So what's this prediction based on? And what exactly is this prediction anyway? Well, it's based on Old Testament promise and Old Testament prophecy. The apostle here, in verse 26, is quoting from the prophet Haggai. He's quoting from Haggai chapter 2 and verse 26. Now, if you were to turn to that chapter, you would see that Haggai was speaking there about the great changes that came into the world with Christ's birth, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and, of course, his ascension. At that point in history, Haggai said, great changes are going to come upon the world. Much that had continued the same up till then for many hundreds of years was going to be shaken. Much that had continued the same up until then was going to be removed. God was going to shake and God was going to remove. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. We're told specifically there in verse 26 that two things are going to be shaken. The earth and heaven. What does that mean? What does that have to do with the coming of Christ? How could that old promise be fulfilled with the coming of Christ? Well, you remember that the way in which the Lord, especially towards the end of his ministry, began to prophesy the end of Jerusalem and the Jewish state as it was then constituted. Increasingly, this note comes into his ministry that these things with which they were so familiar were going to be shaken and removed. You remember the occasion, for instance, when he's at the temple and he and the disciples are looking at the great stones around the temple and the Lord says they're going to come down. They're going to be taken apart. And so they did in the year AD 70. We know that the Romans came, finally a, a crushing and breaking the a, a Jewish state. Its people were scattered 
and all that was ordinary and familiar was removed. That's what this is referring to. The apostle here is reminding these Jewish believers that very soon the Jewish state and all that was familiar and part and parcel of it was going to be shaken and removed according to the promise and the prediction of God. But let's look just a little more closely. There are two things that are going to be shaken. The earth, first of all, is going to be shaken and removed. That's a reference to their temporal, worldly possessions. Their land, their earth, the things that they had, the things they had all around them, their land and all that it contained, all they possessed in it, was very shortly going to be shaken to its very core. It was going to come down. The Romans would finally have had enough. Their political system, their political leaders, all of that was about to undergo the most fearful shaking and the most a dramatic removal. Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. What's heaven? How's heaven going to be shaken? Well, the reference uh, there is to the church in Israel. Its spiritual practices, its spiritual privileges. Because not only would the national infrastructure be taken away, but the Jewish church, the Old Testament church as it was, was also about to be shaken and removed. The temple, for instance, would be destroyed and brought down. The priesthood and everything that functioned around that temple would be broken and scattered and removed. Paul here, writing, of course, to Jewish Christians, is predicting that the whole of their national life was going to be shaken to the very dust. These Jewish Christians were constantly under pressure to return, to come back, to abandon Christ and the gospel and to return to the temple and the priesthood and all that they had. The apostle is saying, you needn't think about going back to these trappings of Judaism. They're about to be shaken. In fact, they're about to be removed. And the prophecy made in Haggai is close, close to being a brought to pass. Paul makes a prediction. The one whose voice once shook the earth at Sinai is going to speak again. He's going to come in very solemn judgment. And he's going to shake the earth and the heaven. Well, there's lots being shaken and removed in our day. In the midst of a national, national emergency, there's a lot of shaking and a lot of removing. If the Jewish way of life was shaken in AD 70, well, so is ours right now. Things are being shaken right now that appeared unshakable a few weeks ago. It was the same for the Jews in AD 70. They never imagined the temple and the worship and, and the, the ordinary way of life. They, they, they thought it would continue more or less as it had. Yes, they had problems and the Romans were there as an occupying force, but it'll continue. And suddenly the Lord steps in and it, it comes to a grinding halt. Oh, it's come to a grinding halt. Things are being removed right now that seemed immovable. Who would have believed a few weeks ago that we would be where we are now? Our economies 
the world economy grinding to a halt, our whole way of life shaken, and God removing many things, not least the open breaches of his law and of his day. You see, God is showing us that he can shake the earth. God is showing us that he can swiftly bring things down. The earth to tremble thou hast made, we sang in Psalm 60. Therein its breaches make. Yes, indeed. Do thou thereof the breaches heal, because the land doth shake. He can shake society, just as he shook Jewish society. In the first exiles of the Old Testament, the first period of exiles, and in that great event of AD 70, he can shake society, and he can shake his church, and he can remove candlesticks if he so wishes. And solemnly he can close church doors. And who knows? There may be a great deal more shaking required before this nation turns to him. Paul makes a prediction. But then secondly, Paul shares a proclamation. How alarming this must have seemed to these Jewish believers. This message that that Old Testament prophecy was about to be fulfilled and that even as the Lord himself had said, the Romans were going to come and their society and their world was going to come apart. How alarming and fearful this must have seemed for these Jewish Christians. Are we going down with all the rest, they must have wondered. What's going to happen to us when all this shaking is going on, when all this removing is going on? Well, in verse 27, Paul says, there are other things that can't be shaken and can't be removed. Look at verse 26 there, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Paul here is sharing God's solemn proclamation. that there were some things that are unshakable. That Christ and his kingdom and those who are in his kingdom are unshakable no matter what else is shaken, no matter what else is removed. On this rock, he says, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not, cannot, will not prevail against it. So Paul is saying to these Jewish Christians, as you see the old Jewish state, as you see the nation collapsing and being removed, don't be afraid. As you see the temple and everything that was associated with it being removed, don't be afraid. Because as Christians... You have received admission to another kingdom. A spiritual kingdom that cannot be removed. That will never be dismantled. Whose enemies will never, ever, ever rush in and crush and break and destroy. You see, he's reminding them. That in Christ, they weren't merely part of a physical, ethnic, national, 
a kingdom of this world. My kingdom is not of this world, says Christ. His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And it's made up of those who are saved by the grace of their king. Oh, the grace of their king. How wonderful his grace. Their sins have been pardoned through his atoning death in their place as sinners. Their souls are under the government of the king. And he is immovable. And if they are in his kingdom, if they have become citizens of his kingdom, if they have become his subjects, if their sin has been pardoned and their alienation removed and they have been brought near, they have been brought to a place as unshakable as he is unshakable. The kingdom of God is found in the heart in which Christ is king. Are you in it? As everything else is shaking all around us. As so many things are being removed. Are you in a kingdom that cannot be removed? That cannot be shaken? Are you in it? Well, if you are, you're in an unshakable kingdom. That's the proclamation that Paul is sharing with us today. Ah, you think of these Jewish Christians in that first century. And they would see these solemn, terrible events in the fall of Jerusalem and in the fall of their nation. They would see the priesthood removed. They had been brought to look to that priesthood. It was God's ordination set there until the time when Christ would come and they would see that priesthood removed. And Paul is saying, ah, your great high priest can't be removed. His sacrifice can't be invalidated. His continual intercession on your behalf continues even when Jerusalem and its temple is reduced to rubble. Ah, friend, do you have a great high priest in the heavens interceding for you, looking after your interests, no matter what else is removed. In the midst of all of this, he is immovable and he is unshakable. And these Jewish Christians too, they would see their political leaders removed. And Paul is saying, your great king, he's not going to be removed in any of this. He continues subduing us to himself, ruling and defending us, restraining and conquering all his and our enemies, as the Catechism puts it. And they would see the synagogues closed and the people scattered and the religious teachers silenced and shaken to the very core. They wouldn't know what to say and they wouldn't know what to do. But Paul is saying, your prophet, your teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's not going to be silenced. He's not going to be shaken. He's not going to be removed. He will continue to teach by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. Ah, today people are full of fear and uncertainty. You hear it all around, don't you? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? People are saying these are scary times. But Christian, you have a security. That means that even if everything else comes down, if you are in Christ, you have received, as it says in verse 28, a kingdom which cannot be moved. Can't be moved by COVID-19. Or by anything else. We're going to sing in a, in a moment in Psalm 46. Though hills amidst the seas be cast. Though kingdoms moved where. God in the midst of her doth dwell. Nothing. Nothing what? Nothing shall her remove. The Lord to her and help her will. And that right early prove. 
as I was thinking about these things this week, I remembered the poem by Lachlan Mackenzie Loch Carran. It's called The Christian's Firm Bank. It was written originally in Gaelic, but somebody translated it into English. I have an ever-failing bank, says Mackenzie, a more than golden store. No earthly bank is half so rich. How can I then be poor? Tis when my stock is spent and gone, and I without a groat, I'm glad to hasten to my bank and beg a little note. Base unbelief will lead the child to say what is not true. I tell the soul that feels self-lost, these notes belong to you. You have a kingdom that cannot be moved. The leper had a little note. Lord, if thou wilt, thou can. We looked at that, didn't we, last Lord's Day evening? The leper had a little note. Lord, if thou wilt, thou can. The banker cashed his little note and healed the sickly man. And then he goes on to say, should all the banks in Britain break, the Bank of England smash, bring in your notes to Zion's bank, you'll surely have your cash. And if you have but one small note, fear not to bring it in. Come boldly to this throne of grace, the banker is within. Though a thousand ransomed souls may say they have no notes at all, because they feel the plague of sin, so ruined by the fall. This bank is full of precious notes, all signed and sealed and free. Though many doubting souls may say there is not one for me. We read of one young man indeed whose riches did abound. But in the banker's book of grace this man was never found. But see the wretched dying thief hang by the banker's side. He cried, dear Lord, remember me. He got his cash and died. Ah, see the wretched dying thief hang by the banker's side. He cried, dear Lord, remember me. He got his cash and died. In this word, verse 21, 27, yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Paul makes a prediction. Paul shares a proclamation. Finally, Paul gives a precaution. Several, in fact. First of all, he says, don't ignore God's voice. Verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Refuse in this context means refuse to listen, refuse to obey. He must be listened to. If they didn't escape, who ignored the voice of God and his law in the Old Testament, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we ignore his voice as he speaks through his word today? As he speaks through providence and COVID-19 and coronavirus, what's he saying to you? What's he saying to you? Is he calling you to himself? After too long, ignoring him and avoiding him. That's the first precaution. Don't ignore God's voice. The second precaution, don't, for, don't bypass God's grace. Don't bypass God's grace. Now you see the reference in verse 28 to the grace of God. It's by grace that we will serve God acceptably. 
In other words, don't try and do it by yourself. We need the power and the work of God's Spirit. I've heard a number of people say this week, I'm going to be different when this is over. This is going to change us. Well, any real lasting spiritual change is going to need more than a coronavirus. If that's all it is, the change will be merely outward and fairly temporary in many, many ways. We need a greater change that only God can effect. We need the work of God in our hearts. Otherwise, we'll emerge from this only harder and colder and further away from God and the things of God. Mere outward visitations like this, unless they're blessed by God, they produce no lasting spiritual benefit. Let us have grace, says the Apostle. Let us seek grace. Let us exercise grace, whereby we may serve God. Oh, don't ignore God's voice. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. But don't bypass God's grace. Don't think, well, I'm going to reform myself. I'm going to change myself. I'm seeing this terrible shaking and I realize I need to put things in order because eternity is, 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 is suddenly very close. I, I better give myself a shakedown. Ah, don't bypass God's grace. And finally, don't forsake God's way. As things are shaken, let's not wander from the things of God. Let us have grace so that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's our duty, your duty. In the midst of all of this, don't ignore God's voice. Don't bypass God's grace. Don't forsake God's way. A prediction, a proclamation, and what a proclamation it is, but a precaution. Three, in fact. Well, things are being shaken. But there's a greater shaking yet to come. When the things, the temporary things of this world are all going to be removed at the last day and then the things that can't be removed and are eternal they'll stand forever. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that event? We receiving a kingdom. What a kingdom. What a king who promises to supply all you need, but who in verse 29 is described for us as a consuming fire. In other words, he is not to be trifled with. You, having received a kingdom, let us have grace to serve God acceptably. Have you received the kingdom? Well, you can only receive the kingdom if you receive the king. And for many in his own day, it was a case that he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. The kingdom is open 
and is receiving sinners. And all who come, there is a promise that he will in no wise cast them out. But the day will come when the door of the kingdom, like the door of the ark, will be closed and the day of opportunity will have gone. A prediction, a proclamation, a precaution. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's pray. Eternal Lord, we marvel at thy word, its clear predictions. In the Old Testament, the end of the Jewish state and the Old Testament church, its time had come to an end for Christ had come. These were things that could be shaken and things that would be removed. But there were other things that couldn't be shaken and were not possible to be removed. And so it is still. If we have received a kingdom that cannot be removed, what a blessing that is. But help us, Lord, as we rejoice in the proclamation of the security of the church and all who are within its bounds saved by Christ that we would heed the precautions, that we would not ignore God's voice. Remember those who have been ignoring it. Grant that today they would cease to ignore, that we would not bypass God's grace, that we would not try to do it ourselves, to somehow work our own entrance into the kingdom, because that is not how it is. We do not come in earning our way or paying our passage, but we can come as beggars, and we can beg. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I will be clean. Oh, what a blessing that is. Help us all to come as lepers. Help us all to come as the thief on the cross. Help us to see the poor, wretched, dying thief hang by the banker's side. And help us to cry as he cried, Lord, remember me. And that we would get out of the bank of heaven and its store. Oh, its gold and its silver. And all that we need. This never failing fund of grace. That is promised to those who trust in him. Be with us, Lord, throughout the day. Be with us in the evening when we gather and worship. Bless the word then. And the voice of thy servant proclaiming it. And forgive us our sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, I mentioned Psalm, I mentioned Psalm 46. And we'll sing from it now, verses 1 to 5. The tune is Stroud Water. God is our refuge and our strength. In streets of present aid. Therefore, although the earth remove, we will not be afraid. Though hills amidst the seas be cast, though waters roaring make and troubled be, yea, though the hills by swelling seas do shake. Then verse 5, God in the midst of her doth dwell, nothing shall her remove. The Lord to her and help her will and that right early prove. One through five, the tune is Stroud Water. God is our refuge and our strength.
Now, God willing, uh, evening service at 6 p.m. That service will be conducted by Reverend Tom Budgeon. Now, Mr. Budgeon is unable to live stream the service.